This program was made possible by a grant from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs. Hello everyone, I'm Charna davis Weesey, and welcome to For Your Health. Ed Highland is out on assignment. On today's show, sometimes it's referred to as an invisible disability, language and literacy disorders among teenagers. These students can be a mystery to teachers who can't figure out why their students are struggling academically. We'll have an in-depth discussion just ahead. Also ahead, the HPV vaccine is potentially life-saving, and yet parents aren't exactly rushing to have their children protected. HPV, the human papillomavirus, is a virus that can lead to a sexually transmitted disease that has the potential to cause cancer. So when the HPV vaccine was released in 2006, it was heralded as a breakthrough, at least within some portions of the medical community. Parents, though, may have some different views. From the slide to the pool, to just laughing with her mom. 12-year-old Jessica Ballard soaks in every minute of being a kid. But her mom knows these carefree days won't last forever. But I'm going to miss them. Soon her preteen will be a teen, and with that comes new worries. Now there's a new way for Juliet to protect her daughter from something that could harm her, HPV, the human papillomavirus. It's a sexually transmitted disease. It's actually the most common sexually transmitted disease. 80% of people carry some form of HPV. Now the FDA has approved a vaccine that could protect women from it. Girls as young as nine can get the vaccine before they become sexually active. So that they could be protected against the virus before it develops into either precancerous lesions on the cervix or cervical cancer. Pediatrician Amanda Dempsey has one child and another on the way. She knows it's a difficult decision for parents. Some nine and 10 year olds are really fearful of vaccinations, but most of them take it in stride. Some parents worry that their child may believe it's now okay for them to have sex. Jessica's mom might not fully explain to her daughter what the vaccine is for, but she'll make sure her daughter gets one. As sheltered as she is, I still want to protect her from things that she might encounter in life. And as rampant as the disease is, it, it seems like it's something that I should protect her from. And hopefully, Jessica will be able to hold on to her innocence a while longer. Girls rule and boys jewel. I'm Marty Salt reporting. The HPV vaccine remains mired in controversy. Among the questions researchers are raising is whether the vaccine provides lifelong protection. A language disorder can encompass a lot of things. It could be a problem with speech, or it can mean there's a problem understanding a basic conversation. And where there's a language disorder, there's sometimes a literacy disorder. Among teenagers, these problems can go unrecognized. The student struggles academically, and the teacher struggles to provide guidance. With me today is Dr. Barbara Aaron from UCF's Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, which is in the College of Health and Public Affairs. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. This is so near and dear to me, being a mom, <laughs> being a child who goes to, having a child who goes to your clinic for speech therapy, being a child who had speech therapy. Such a huge amount of different things that fall within the purview of, of your group. But this yes. one today is something that may, as we say, go unnoticed, unrecognized. A child could be struggling in school, having a very hard time, because their language, different than the language the teacher is thinking of, is not sinking. Now, when you talk about language in, ter in terms of your career versus language during the language they teach in school, it's different. We're talking about the oral language, the spoken and, and heard language, not necessarily the language we study. So a problem with that can lead to a problem with the language you study. Am I correct? 
Well, I, I think the best way to think about it is that language has many modes or modalities. There's spoken language and there's written language. And so when you start to think about younger children, students who have trouble early on, it's easily detectable, typically. I mean, you, they talk funny. <laughs> you know, you can tell there's something wrong. And that's with the more observable language problems. However, what we're finding is, as those students get older and they advance to the uh, upper grades, those problems that they had in oral language as youngsters blossom, unfortunately, into problems with written language. Now, it's also possible that, that children do not have spoken language problems early on that are immediately detectable, but they do have a problem with the foundational language that does, in fact, cause them problems with uh, reading and writing. Could they do a good job of hiding it or compensating think... around it? It's, 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 it's certainly not intentional in the right. sense of hiding it, but what happens, I think, is, is and we know this uh, from a lot of the research that we've been doing, that it's the demands that escalate as students get older. So uh, if you think about the metaphor of a building and you think about uh, early language as foundation, as the foundation, and oral language experiences providing that foundation, it is possible to have hairline cracks in that foundation that really don't get detected until you start building more than just the first floor. When you get to build the second floor and the third floor, and if we think of those floors as being middle school, high school, past the elementary or the, or the you know, basic floor, then it's possible that those hairline cracks really make the whole building cave in, if you will. So that it's possible that those problems existed early on and they just were not uh, detectable because the demands were not there. Once they get to high school, too, there's so much that's given to them that they have to listen to and process. Even in high school, the teacher is telling them so much that it may not be registering and it may be difficult for them to go ahead and do the assignment. Well, there's that. That is certainly true. I think uh, one of the most important things that we focus on, though, with teenagers is the uh, written language component because that is really where they have to uh, focus as adolescents. They have to learn by reading the textbook. They do have to listen to lecture, that's for sure, but they have to absorb information that they read and they have to write. And so the challenges there are with academic language. And the same thing would be true in terms of teacher lecture. The teacher's not lecturing in conversational language. They're lecturing in academic language. So a student who can chit chat all day long with his friends and even with uh, adults mm -hmm. uh, is not necessarily the student who is having difficulty with written language. So it's a different set of demands is really the bottom line here. And with the written language placing more strenuous demands typically. And students who are adolescents, uh, if they're savvy enough, and, and many of them are, can negotiate their way around oral language, but they can't negotiate negotiate their way around the textbooks. Right, and we're talking about some kind of disconnect in the information coming in and being able to really process that information. It's not, they're not paying attention. It's not that they're, they're not working hard. It's not that they're not necessarily listening. Is that right? Well, that's the million dollar question there. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, there are many, many reasons why adolescents struggle with literacy, some of which are related to not having had the appropriate learning experiences early on. There really isn't anything wrong with them. They don't have a learning disability. They might have what we would refer to as a teaching disability. Mm -hmm. They weren't given the appropriate kind of instruction early on, and so they don't develop the written language uh, skills in reading and writing that they need. On the other hand, there is such a thing called language learning disability. And that is a heterogeneous group of disorders which we really don't know what causes them. And many people would say they're presumed to be of an internal neurological origin, but not that you would get any kind of inclination on an EEG or on an MRI. I mean, 
although certainly more and more studies are being done with the neurological basis for some of these things. And we do have some data to, to identify that there may be some anatomical differences in students with uh, especially dyslexia, which is a kind of language learning disability. Are there certain things to look out for, certain behaviors, certain uh, that would say, you know, this might be a child with a fluency disorder for a parent or even a teacher? With a language mm -hmm. disorder. Um, well, students not doing well in school. I mean, number one. <laughs> number one, students who are struggling with academics, what we want to do is make sure that we investigate what's underneath the academic problem. And language and language skills and strategies are what we call access skills to academics. So very often students are doing poorly academically because they don't have these access skills. And that's where we come in as speech language pathologists. We our expertise is in language and in collaboration with other folks like reading specialists, classroom teachers, special ed teachers, school psychologists, we can certainly put together um, an inquiry into what is going on academically with the student and what needs to be done to help. That must be the hardest part though, especially with how crowded schools are now, is finding those children that you can help. Actually, it's not, not that hard. That's good news. <laughs> it's not that hard. That's good news. We just have to do it. We have to be sensitive to enough, and this is, the, herein lies the major problem. The problem. We have to be sensitive enough in middle and high school to the existence of language-based learning disabilities or language-based problems to academic failure, some of which may not be disabilities per se. Right. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that as soon as we come back. We're back, we're talking with Dr. Barbara Aaron and we're talking about language disorders. Sometimes these can manifest as behavioral problems. Yes, without a doubt. I mean, there are students who uh, act out because they're frustrated. So that's perhaps one of the most obvious uh, situations. But there are also students whose behavior is misinterpreted as being obstinate or contrary when in fact it's they don't understand what you're asking them to do. They can't do it. Well, they don't understand what you're asking them right. to do. They might be able to do it if you rephrased. If they knew what it was. Yeah, if you rephrased, if you said it in a different way. You uh, know, and somebody from outside of your field, it seems so daunting to me to figure out which is the kid that has the language disorder and which is the kid that's obst obstinate. That must be the biggest challenge. Well, we don't uh, we don't have magic fairy dust either, no. so it's not. <laughs> it is it is uh, a challenge in that particular instance to look at chicken and egg kind of situations. But we do have our um, diagnostic tools and our diagnostic eye and ear, and uh, that's that's how we're uh, prepared as speech language pathologists to ferret out those kinds of things and again in collaboration with other people we don't do these things Lone Ranger style we right. work with other folks like classroom teachers. Now once you do find the, the teenager who is having the problem what kind of um, training what do you do to help them? Well as students get older and as they progress in the grades it, it is certainly more difficult to design delivery structures in schools because high school is a very complicated place. Uh, kids have to get Carnegie units to graduate. Mm -hmm. But we have various delivery structures. We work within classrooms. Sometimes we go in and we co-teach with other special education teachers, or we work collaboratively with the regular classroom teachers to figure out how they can accommodate the students' needs. There are some programs where a speech language pathologist will actually teach an elective course in language learning strategies. Uh, so there are a number of different ways we go about doing that depending on the structure of the school. And one thing we talked about is that this affects the child in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Not only struggling in school, emotionally, socially, it has a broad implications for each, each teenager. Absolutely, and of course with, with the high dropout rates that we are experiencing nationwide and in Florida, this is of concern. We can't afford to lose 
students. And as our president has just indicated, it's not an option. Dropping out is not an option. So I think as we get more serious about looking at what the root causes are of dropping out, then we will have to pay more attention to the language variables. And again, I, want, I really want to stress that not every adolescent who struggles with literacy has a language learning disability per right. se, but there may be language factors related to their lack of academic achievement that speech language pathologists still are in a position to assist with. And we're not talking about, oh, this is just one kid, or this is just one kid, this is just, because it, it impacts all of us. We have a huge problem nationwide in terms of adolescent literacy. The estimates are that in terms of eighth graders, only about 30% of our eighth graders have proficient reading skills. That's mind boggling when you think about it. And then 25% of them don't even have the basic reading skills. So th those numbers are enormous. Those and are the people that are going to be inheriting our country. Right, now they do not have, not all of those students have language learning disabilities, right. but there's something some not do. right, some do, but there's something not right about the way we're approaching the teaching of reading and writing. And one of the things we would say is that we're ignoring the broad-based issues in language. You know, it's funny, we talk about writing and reading. I remember just as uh, the, these interns would come in the newsroom and want to be reporters, and they'd say, you have to write, mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to read. There's no way, yeah. of course. You have to read and write with everything you yeah. do. It's their basis of the rest of their lives. And with the growing technology fields that are blossoming in our society, there is more need for what we call high literacy. You can't get by. Not with anymore. even basic literacy, you cannot get by with it Not and anymore. be employed. Let's talk about your baby, structure your reading. <laughs> ah, yes, it was a long birthing process. <laughs> <laughs> Six years of study. Um, and uh, it is, my interest in research is helping adolescents become strategic readers. How to approach the reading process in a planful, effective way. No, just, not just to get finished with the assignment. Not just pick up <laughs> and go from page one to page 33, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this is a, an approach to help students get control of their own reading processes in a very structured way. Um, and it can be used by a number of different kinds of people. Reading people use it, reading specialists, uh, speech language pathologists work in collaboration with other folks in using it. And uh, we have some uh, very good data behind it in it's terms working. of its effectiveness. Yes. I was looking at it and trying to, trying to get as much as I could on my little computer. It is almost like a step-by-step -step guide on it's, how to understand, yes, including it, that bookmark is fabulous. It's very explicit because one of the things and uh, one of the organizational structures we use in teaching reading is to teach students what they have to do before, during, and after reading. And so this is a series of prompts that they ask themselves and a series of steps that they take to be very planful and specific about doing these things that we know are effective in setting up yourself for success before you read, to do what you need to do in terms of thinking during reading, and then to reflect on what you've read and in interact with other people about what you've read. So it's a very structured approach to help manage a systematic uh, approach to strategic reading. Does it become automatic after a while? That's what the research says about strategic instruction, that after a while students learn how to become strategic on their own after they do enough of it. You know, when you said that, it, it was kind of like an aha moment for me, thinking while you're reading. It's something that you would think just comes naturally, but probably doesn't for well, many people. And, and one of my favorite stories is the 17-year-old young man in a juvenile justice facility uh, when I was field testing structured reading, who said to me, I'm 17 years old. Why did y'all wait until now to tell me that you have to think while you're reading? It didn't occur to him and nobody taught him that there were things that were supposed to be going on in his head. To him, while he, he was, was just reading. finishing the assignment, getting the assignment done. Well, and, and reading until it sounded right, which kind of made me think that people worked on a lot on oral reading and what we call fluency in reading mm -hmm. and not a lot on comprehension. 
And the comprehension part, I'm telling you, even my kids, they, they fight that. They don't want to think while they're reading. I'm glad the teachers force them to. <laughs> well, they, you have to. Comprehension, uh, some kids just figure it out on their own, but many do not. Thankfully, there are people like you <laughs> to help so many kids. Dr. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. I'm Charney Davis-Weesey. We're so glad you joined us. See you again next time on 4 Your Life.